All right, guys. Hello, everyone. Peace of Christ to all. Sorry for this. Um, I was trying hard to get uh, Brother Sam here, uh, but each time I try to establish it, um, it was taking me. Uh, it doesn't show you where to invite the guest. Uh, this was what uh, was happening exactly. Uh, I'm waiting for Brother uh, Sam to be here. I hope he will be with us and he will be able to join. Let's see. All right. Uh, I'm just waiting for Brother Sam to be here with us. I sent him an invitation, and I hope he will be with us very soon. Uh, the problem, each time I try to invite him, uh, like I open the page in the setup, and it doesn't show the, the option where it says uh, invite a guest. And this is exactly what was happening. So I hope soon, Brother Sam, he will be with us here. Maybe he is now. Let us hope so. Look like how he is texting me. Okay, you should. I'm texting him right now. He will be able to do it. Anyway, today our topic, as we said before, it's about going to be uh, uh, the Bible and violence. And sorry for this, like uh, Brother Sam and me, this is the first time we have a guest, so this is the first time we use this program. I hope he will be able to do it. I think he is with us now. I can, I can actually see him. Do you hear me, uh, Sam? Yeah, can you hear me? Hey, bro, good to see you. Good to see you. <clears throat> so you can hear me now? Yes, I do. Actually, we are live on air, and everybody can hear you. Man, about time. Just trying to figure this out. It's hard. Yeah, it's all right. Well, I, you know, like uh, uh, I was trying to invite you uh, because I texted you before I start, and you said you are going to teach, right? So you yeah, can't yeah. do it right now. And then you send me a text saying, "Well, I'm free now." So anyway, I had to restart the whole thing, yeah. and uh, I'm sure more people here they are happy to see you with us. So, uh, brother Sam, today we have uh, the topic is about uh, there's an article. Uh, actually, I'm going to give you the link uh, so you can read it in your computer uh, with me. Uh, it's an article about violence in the Bible. There is someone, he is supposedly a professor, who he found that, uh, uh, he discovered that the, the, the Bible is a lot more violence or violent than, than the Quran. Yeah. And actually, the Quran is the book which have violence to defense, not like the Bible. The link, the link yeah. I, I just gave you. Let me see where okay, let me see. You sent me a link. Okay, I gotta just I gotta learn how to work this. Hold on. I'm learning. Yeah, I know. So the Bible is more violent than the Quran. Okay. Okay, I yeah. see your link. All right. Well, it comes from NPR. <clears throat> yeah. NPR 
is infamous for being liberals who hate Christianity and will support anyone that attacks and condemns the Bible and Christianity. So what's new? Right. But uh, you know, the, the funny about this article, if you see, that this guy, he discovered that the Quran is the book state, or let us say state violence, but to defense when the, the, the Bible is stating violence to uh, annihilation. Yeah. So what do you think? You know, I, I can address the issue of the Bible. I mean, you're the expert on the Quran. But yeah. before I do that, I just want to make sure. <clears throat> I see on my screen, I see this clip and a picture of a guy with glasses. How do I see you guys? Yeah, this is what you This is the guy who wrote the article. All right. Okay. Uh, actually, I'm sharing the article with everybody in the in the in the live podcast, so they can see with us what we are reading exactly. All right. Uh, how do I know? How do I know how many are on? Or that doesn't matter. You are on here already. Uh, if okay. you want to open your camera, I can I can switch to you. You want to open your camera so people they can see you. It's up to you. Uh, let me just see. I gotta work it. Hold on, it's asking me to do stuff. All right. All right. Let me see. What is it? Default speed. Okay. Let's see. I don't know. Let me care or not. It says. Oh, I'm sorry. This computer doesn't have a camera. I'm it, not on Mac. No problem. Sorry, as long as you guys can see me. Yeah. Okay, or hear me. All right, yeah, that's fine. I can talk about that when it talks about the uh, Old Testament violence. Because he's talking about the Old Testament, I assume. That right. supposedly the Old Testament is much more violent than what we find in the Quran. <clears throat> is, and the Quran supposedly teaches only defense of jihad. Well, mm -hmm. you're the expert on Islam. You know that it doesn't teach defense of jihad. But if you want me to talk about the Old Testament, I can. Yeah, go ahead about the Bible. Let's see what you what you yeah. share about the Bible and uh, how we can explain to Christians. Because I got this from a Christian saying, how yeah. we can answer this. Easy. Is that? I hope that Christian's there because I did a talk on it. You can find on YouTube a two-hour lecture on this, and I've written articles, but I'll do it here again. <clears throat> but just again, I beg the God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to fill every one of us, fill you and me, with His Spirit clothe us with the Spirit, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> give us wisdom, understanding, knowledge, to interpret scriptures correctly, and to purify our hearts in the blood of Jesus, to magnify the name of Jesus Christ, protecting us from error, <clears throat> anointing our mouths, speak the truth in love, and passionately for the glory of Jesus. We beg you, Father, use this session, use our meager efforts to magnify your Son, the Lord Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit, and bless us to speak truth without error. In Jesus' name we pray. <clears throat> I always have to ask the Lord to bless us. Um, if you want to understand how the Old Testament, quote-unquote, violent passages work, the history <clears throat> of the so-called uh, violence begins in Genesis 15, as the Lord Jesus strengthens my voice. And guys, do pray for my voice. These couple weeks, I've had a sore throat. Pray that God will heal my throat for His glory so I can use my voice to glorify Him. That's why I'm looking for healing. Uh, they're going to talk about God ordering the Israelites to wipe out everything that breathes <clears throat> in Canaan, right? That's the, mm -hmm. that's the passage, you know, wipe out everything that breathes, have no mercy. Well, if we really want to do justice to this passage, CP, we have to look at it from Genesis 15. <clears throat> so I'm going to look at the Bible verses. And let me know when you want me to stop and take questions. But I'm going to make a case, slowly but surely, to show you that if you read the so-called... <clears throat> violent texts in the context of the Bible, you're going to actually see that God was very loving, very patient, very compassionate, very merciful, and very just. And you'll see why. If you go to Genesis 15, God promises Abraham <clears throat> that his descendants will inherit the land of the Canaanites. They're going to inherit the land. Now, I'm going to use the NIV, New International Version. I know some people may not like this translation. It doesn't matter what translation you use, but since I'm reading... I'm going to have to read and then comment. God tells Abraham that his descendants would inherit the land of Canaan, but they'd have to wait 400 years. Now, why would they have to wait 400 years? Let me read Genesis 15, 12 to 16. And CP, if you have any comments for people, let me know because I don't see the comments. Sure. <clears throat> As the sun was setting, Abraham fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then Yahweh said to him, know for certain. Now watch this. For 400 years, your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. Now watch here. In the fourth generation, this is verse 16, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. So God says, 
I'm going to wait 400 years and four generations from now before I give you the land, give it to your descendants. And he explains why. Now notice the CP. Verse 16, he says, the reason why I'm going to wait 400 years, <clears throat> for the sin of the Amorites, another name for the Canaanites, a name that they were later called, has not yet reached its full measure. So I want everyone to pay attention and see if you understand what is being said here. God is going to tolerate and wait patiently 400 years until the sin of the Amorites reach its limit where he cannot tolerate anymore. In other words, for 400 years, God showed them patience and mercy and compassion in allowing them to continue in their wickedness and sin and not punishing them. And yet every generation of Amorites, <clears throat> instead of repenting and turning to God and fearing him, continued in the wickedness of the generation before. For 400 years, God tolerated this. Now let me show, explain what kind of sins God put up with. <clears throat> so everyone has to turn with me to Leviticus 18. <clears throat> Sorry about my voice. Trusting the Holy Spirit to sanctify the healing. I mean. Now notice, CP, what God put up with, tolerated for 400 years. What his holy eyes, his pure eyes saw for 400 years. This is Leviticus 18. <clears throat> so we're going to have to read it. Yahweh said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, I am Yahweh, your God. You must not do as they do in Egypt, where you used to live. And you must not do as they do in the land of Canaan, where I am bringing you. Now notice, this is 400 years later, and he's telling the Israelites, he's about to bring them into Canaan. You must obey my laws and be careful to follow my decrees. Do not follow their practices. I am Yahweh, your God. <clears throat> Keep my decrees and laws, for the person who obeys them will live by them. I am Yahweh. Now watch. For 400 years, folks, this is what God put up with from the Amorites, the Canaanites. For 400 years, this is what his eye saw. No one is to approach any close relative to have sexual relations. I am Yahweh. Do not dishonor your father by having sexual relations with your mother. She is your mother. Do not have relations with her. Do not have sexual relations with your father's wife. That would dishonor your father. <clears throat> Do not have sexual relations with your sister, either with your father's daughter or your mother's daughter, whether she was born in the same home or elsewhere. Do not have sexual relations with your son's daughter or your daughter's daughter, that would dishonor you, your grandchild. Do not have sexual relations with the daughter of your father's wife, right? Your stepmother's daughter, stepsister, right? Born to your father, she is your sister. Do not have sexual relations with your father's sister, your aunt, she is your father's close relative. Do not have sexual relations with your mother's sister, because she's your mother's close relative. So bear with me as I read this. I have to read it so you can understand the impact, right? Do not dishonor your father's brother, by approaching his wife to have sexual relations. She is your aunt. Do not have sexual relations with your daughter-in-law, like Muhammad did. She is your son's wife. Do not have sexual relations, with, sexual relations with her. Do not have sexual relations with your brother's wife. That would dishonor your brother. Do not have sexual relations with both the woman and her daughter. I know you guys are getting tired, but you got to listen so you understand it's the okay. point. It's okay. <laughs> Do not have sexual relations with either his son's daughter or her, her daughter's daughter. They are her close relatives. That is wickedness. Do not take your wife's sister as a rival wife and have sexual relations with her while your wife is living. Do not approach a woman to have sexual relations during the uncleanness cleanness of her monthly period. Do not have sexual relations with your neighbor's wife and defile yourself with her. Do not take any of your children and sacrifice them to Molech of this false god. For you must not profane the name of your god, I am Yahweh. Do not have sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman. That is detestable. Do not have sexual relations with an animal and defile yourself with it. A woman must not present herself to an animal to have sexual relations with it. That is a perversion. Do not defile yourselves in any of these ways because this is how the nations that I'm going to drive out before you became defiled. So you understand that, CP? Yes. God says all of these evils and filth is what the Canaanites have been doing for 400 years. And that's why I'm driving them out. And he says don't defile yourselves. Because this is how the nations that I'm going to drive out before you became defiled. Even the land was defiled. They even made the land dirty, polluted, right? So I punished it for its sin, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. Now notice how strong this language is. It's saying the very land that these people lived in got sick of them and threw them up. Meaning even the land itself, it was a person, would be begging God, remove them from me. They, they disgust me. 
So here God is imagining the land as a person throwing up all this filth because even the land is disgusted by it. But you must keep my decrees and my laws. The native born and the foreigners residing among you must not do any of these detestable things. For all these things were done by the people lived in the land before you and the land became defiled. And if you defile the land, it will vomit you out as it vomit out the nations that were before you. So notice how fair God is. God is saying to Israelites, if you do what they do, the same thing will happen to you. I will throw you out of the land. Everyone who does any of these detestable things, such persons must be cut off from their people. Keep my requirements and do not follow any of the detestable customs that were practiced before you came and do not defile yourselves with them. Notice, these customs that were being done before you showed up in the land. I am Yahweh, your God. So let's review, CP. <clears throat> For 400 years, God put up with incest. Brother sleeping with sister, father sleeping with daughter, mother sleeping with son, etc., etc. Bishali, human beings sleeping with animals, and murdering children by offering them, offering them as sacrifices to a false god named Moloch, let alone all the bloodshed and murder that they did. So that means for 400 years, God in his patience and his love and compassion tolerated generation after generation, adding to the sin of the generation before them without even one sign of repentance. You know what that means, CP? Mm -hmm. It means that every infant that was born grew up to be just as wicked as his parents. So you see an infant, right? But God sees an infant who's going to be just as wicked as his parents that came before him. I'll give you an example, just to give you an example, because we know God knows everything. Sin what if God had... I'm sorry, I mean, go ahead. I mean, sin became a culture in this society. Oh, yeah, it became a cancer that if you didn't cut it off, it would spread and it would then <clears throat> destroy and kill the entire area. Why do you think God says don't do it? Because then you'll be polluted by their customs and I'm going to have to do to you what I did to them. But let me give you an example, a modern example. What if God had told you, look, CP, you see that little cute baby uh, infant Hitler? Yes, mm -hmm. go kill it. You'd probably be shocked and say, what do you mean, God? He's, a, he's an innocent infant. What and God tells you, you don't see what I see. That little infant is going to turn out to be a monster, and he's going to murder 13 million people. So now, from that perspective, from God's perspective, is God just to take the life of even infants, whom he knows will turn out to be just as wicked as the generation before them? Because that's what every generation of infants turn out to be, just as wicked for 400 years, right? Mm -hmm. So is God just or evil for doing what he did? <clears throat> well, uh, you know... Uh... Uh, you know, when when, uh, when people like us, uh, uh, Sam, when they see this issue, they yeah. say, well, he is just a, a child and he did not know anything. And then, but what you said is very true, that God, he knows what, what we do not know. So exactly. if God can prevent something from happening, that is exactly what's happening. He is not just killing, it's not about killing a, a, a child. At the same time, uh, what I understand about uh, killing, uh, it's uh, if, 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 if God is the one who gave me, he have the right to take me, which means yeah, exactly. I'm not really like you know when when we when somebody die we say he died, but the fact he got killed, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. I mean God he gave he gave you your soul he take it back. So why people don't complain from people dying every day? Exactly, and with that said, don't forget CP. The reason why I see God in His infinite wisdom waiting 400 years is to prove the point. Every generation started out as infants, right, as babies, right. But then they turn out to be moral monsters, didn't they? So it's getting more ugly. Yes. In other words, that infant that was cute, 10 years later, he started sleeping with a sister. 15 years later, he started sleeping with animals. 20 years later, he started murdering innocent people and robbing them. So what happened? I thought he was a cute infant baby. Yeah. Because you don't see what God sees. He sees an evil, <clears throat> sinful nature that if it's not checked, will then take that innocent infant and turn him into a moral monster. And proof of it, which generation of those Canaanites repented? Did any of them repent? Never. Never, right? It's, Even it's when like... God went to destroy them, they still did not repent. Let me prove it to you. And this is what people don't understand. Even though God gave orders for the Israelites to wipe out everything in Canaan, that would be only true of those Canaanites who refused to leave or repent. Because the Bible indicates, had the Canaanites left, Israel could not pursue them and slay them. And moreover, 
if they showed signs of repentance, God would have then restored them. You know how I know this, CP? Mm -hmm. Joshua chapter 2, verses 8 to 11, the story of Rahab. Joshua 2, verses 8 to 11. Let me read to you the story of Ahab to prove my point. Before the spies lay down for the night, remember these were the spies who went to check out the land of Jericho. And Jericho, by the way, archaeologists confirmed that Jericho was a military base. So this was the military base of the Canaanites. So it was only smart on the part of the Israelites to want to destroy that base because that was their military base. Anyway, before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof, this is Rahab, and said to them, notice this, I know that Yahweh has given you this land. Remember, she's a Canaanite CP, a prostitute. But notice what she's telling the spies. I know that Yahweh has given you this land and a great fear of you have fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how Yahweh dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorite east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. We heard all this. We heard about the miracles that God did for you and this entire city, this entire country, this entire land, is stricken with fear because of what God did for you, right? Now notice what she says here. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you. For Yahweh your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. Now notice what she said. God had already sent advance warning to the Canaanites that he is the true God and that he's fighting for Israel. Therefore, if you're going to oppose Israel, then you're going to be destroyed. Here, her own words testify. She goes, all of us are melting with fear because of you, because we heard what God did for you in splitting the Red Sea, and we know that your God is the true God. So now let me ask you a very basic question. If the Canaanites knew God is with Israel, and God was doing miracles to prove that he's a true God, and God had determined the Canaanites had to leave the land because they polluted the land with their filth, is it God's fault that the Canaanites refused to leave but decided to stay and oppose Israel in light of all the miracles that God showed them that don't mess with these people because if you mess with them, you mess with me and you're going to suffer the consequence? Yeah, but you know, the, those people, obviously, they don't believe in this God, don't, do they? Well, here it says, they know he's God because he did miracles. Now, right. let, me, let me read that part to you again. One more time, watch. But say they know, but they, be, but they don't believe it still, right? They, 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 know. Say they don't care. They're yeah. saying, okay, so what? He's God. We're going to still stay in our land, and with yeah. the help of our gods, we're going to defeat your God. See, that was the attitude. All right. But now, what if they repented? Did Rahab repent? The prostitute, she repented. Not only did she repent, God spared her and her family. In other words, here you have a clear indication that it wasn't written in stone that the Canaanites had to be wiped off, wiped out, if they met two conditions. Number one, either they leave the land, and God wouldn't have the Israelites chase after them and kill them. Or they could repent and then God would engraft them and make them part of the Israelites in that they would worship the God of Israel and experience the same blessings. So is God being more than fair here? You know, I'm, I'm just trying to take the side of those who they are attacking in the Bible. So, so, because, so we, don't, we don't become one side opinion. That's why I'm God. trying to give you a question, which is sound like uh, coming from someone who don't believe in what, what we believe. That's so, why God. Uh, yeah, I, w I will play those, the, the, the game of this atheist. Let us say I will be the atheist, God forbid, or I am a Muslim. And I will say to you, well, uh, you are saying that those people, they know God, they know He is God, and God has given them a warning, and they don't care. Now, is that still justified that God will go after them? Sure, because it's His land, and He gives it to whom He wants, and because of them defiling the land, God is not going to cleanse the land of their filth. If he's God, he owns the world, right? Absolutely. And if he's God, he owns Canaan, right? Uh -huh. And if he's the landlord, doesn't the landlord have the right to make the rules for you to observe if you want to stay in the land? And if you don't observe the rules, doesn't he have every right then to evict you? Correct. Okay, that was it. It's his land. It's his earth. And he's saying, look, because of your filth, 400 years I put up with incest, Parents sleep with their children, sisters sleep with brother, <clears throat> homosexuality, bestiality, murdering uh, uh, in, uh, you know, children, offering children as a sacrifice to false gods, and murders, and on and on. For 400 years, I put up with your filth. No more. Now you need to leave the land. Now you need to be expelled from the land. So either they could have left, 
or if they refuse to leave after God gave them clear signs that he is God through the miracles he did and that Israel was going to now inherit the land if they still refuse to take those warnings and those signs that means they were willfully defying God and challenging God to his face and saying look bring it on well we don't care how many miracles you did in Egypt we don't care if you split the Red Sea with the power of our gods we will defeat you and your people so they were being even more defiant right defiant till the very end mm. isn't that true so I hope that's clear to the people who are listening. Because I don't know the feedback. I'm not seeing yeah, the response. Uh, we, uh, the, the, uh, as for some reason, the, uh, the chat is disabled. I'm not sure why. However, if people have a questions, please you can give us your question in uh, Facebook, and I will carry them on to uh, Brother yeah. Sam. Because uh, I want to make sure they're understanding this. I don't want to confuse them. That yeah. here you see the patience of God, yeah. the love of God, and the compassion of God that He put up with it for 400 years, right? Yeah, but you know, uh, uh, Sam, is, but this is not the only violence in the Bible. Like the Bible speak about, uh, uh, you know, many wars and... Uh, yeah, the same principle in every one of them, CP. If you go read the stories carefully, uh -huh. every one of those in instances where God is, is wiping out someone, it's because they have defied him, right? Defiled mm -hmm. the land. And because of that, God is bringing judgment. But he doesn't just bring judgment on the nation. See, this is where you're going to see how fair God is. The same destruction and judgment he brings on the nations he brought upon Israel to show how fair he is, that he will not tolerate sin no matter where it comes from, but in his patience and love, he will put up with sin, giving you enough time to repent. But once you reach the full measure of your sin, then God reaches a point in which he's going to have to bring destruction because you show every sign of being unwilling to repent and live. For example, he gave the Canaanites 400 years to repent. None of them repented. Not only that, do you remember that statement in Genesis 15, 16? He goes, the reason why the fourth generation went to the land is uh -huh. because the sin of the Amorites have not reached its full measure. You remember he said that? Right, right, yeah. You know, Jesus used that same language. He used that same language, but guess for who? He used it against the Jews. Let me read it to you. Same language that God applied about the sin of the Amorites having a limit that they need to reach before he destroys them watch what Jesus says our Lord in Matthew 23 32 to the Jews Matthew 23 32 go ahead then and complete what your ancestors started complete it fill it up now, compare Genesis 15 16 in the fourth generation your descendants will come back here for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure it hasn't been complete yet now compare what Jesus again said. Let me quote his words again to the Israelites. Go ahead then and complete what your ancestors started. And then he says in 35, 36, this is Matthew 23, 32. You can read all the way to 36. And so upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on the earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly, I tell you, all this will come on this generation. Same language. That God used to describe the Amorites, He tells Abraham, "Look, it's gonna it's gonna take 400 years before your descendants inherit the land, because it's gonna take 400 years for them to complete their sin." That same language Jesus applied to the Jews. He goes, "Fill up, complete the sins of your ancestors, because you'll be the generation that reaches the limit of how much God will put up with, and then God is gonna do to your land and, and to you what He did to the Canaanites." And what did God do? About 40 years later, after Jesus said these words, destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple. All the Jews who remained there were slaughtered, and the Jews who didn't were scattered all over the world. Same thing that happened to the Canaanites. So let us right? say, there is, you know, for God, it's not really about defending the Jew. It's about defending who is with him. You are against yeah. God, against God. Well, you know, you let go. Like you, 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 start, you, you decide to be by yourself. So face it. Right. This is why when the, yeah. Jews, when the Jews themselves, they are not with God. Uh, God did not defend the Jew. He is not taking the side of the Jews. He is taking the side of those who they are uh, following him and those who don't want him. It's like, a, you know, the firefighter, as always, I give this example. A firefighter, he come to your house and he say to you, in your house, a uh, 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 fire will start. You know, I have an alarm and you will have a fire and you will not be able to turn it off. And then you say to him, you know what, I don't care. You know, yes. I, will, I will deal with it by myself. And when the fire starts, you, uh, you complain about why God did not 
uh, you know, come over and save you. And yeah. this is exactly what's happened to the Jews. And it says not only the Jews, it's happening to every nation that's opposing him. But again, notice what you find the consistency. He doesn't rush in to destroy them right away. He gives them time to repent. Yes, they give him time. Right. The Canaanites 400 years. And I want the audience to remember because I'm going to hammer this point. That means every generation of new babies, infants, grew up to be just as wicked as the generation before. So a young baby boy born within 10 to 15 years, instead of repenting and turning to God, he followed the evil of his parents. So that you're looking at a child who seems to be innocent, but God is looking at a baby who's going to grow up to become evil and wicked like his parents. So in, in one way, I see God's wisdom in waiting 400 years to leave us with no excuse and so that we don't complain because you can say, well, he's a baby. And God will say, hold on. Wasn't that generation before him that grew up, weren't they babies too? Yes. What happened to those babies? Well, they grew up to commit incest, sleeping with animals, murdering, <clears throat> sacrificing children to false God. Oh, but I thought they were babies and they were innocent. So God sees a sinner who's going to sin and commit wickedness. You see an innocent child because you cannot see the way God sees. So in destroying everything that breathes, what he was doing is he was removing the entire cancer. Because what was a pattern? Every generation of ba babies, what happened to them? They became just as wicked as the generation before, right? Yeah. So what did he do? He removed the entire cancer. But here again, you'll see the mercy of God. Now, when he, when he destroyed even infants... That whose parents refused to leave the land because remember I want the people to understand the point Those Canaanites who left the land God did not tell the Israelites to pursue them and kill them if they leave the land they were left alone It's only the Canaanites who refused to leave the land and defy God and remain in the land to fight Israel Even though they testified remember what Rahab said all of us are melting out of fear because of you Because we've seen what your God has done for you. So they're testifying yeah, we see the power of your God. Yeah, we see your God is with you. Yeah, we see God is angry with us because of our sin. But you know what? Who cares? Bring it on. We're going to still fight God and you. So they're adding to their sin by defying God and not fleeing. Had they fled, God would not have the Israelites pursue them. So they would have been safe. Secondly, if they repented, God would have shown them mercy. And what's the proof? Rahab repented. Rahab was a Canaanite. And on top of that, not only was she a Canaanite, ZP, she was a yeah. prostitute. Yeah. And yet when she repented and acknowledged that the God of Israel is the true God, God forgave her and her family and spared them and allowed them to live with the Israelites in Canaan. So is that clear that point? You know, in another way, you know, like even, even today we, we practice something in, in medicine. Like if somebody, let us say, have his leg is infected yeah. and the doctor says to you, you know what, either you die or we cut your leg. So what you choose? Yeah, you know? exactly. So uh, if if uh, if uh, if the part became useless and it became dangerous to uh, uh, to, to to destroy, uh, then uh, you know we go to cut it off. Uh, but no, you have to cut it off. It's, yes, it's gonna then corrupt the rest of the body. Right. So, but none of us because you know none of us like to leave a, an arm or a limb. Uh, but it's a, it's a it's a choice. Uh, uh, let us say it's a, the last choice to choose. So this is why God is waiting for hundreds of years, giving them. Uh, uh, like being patient with them, but uh, obviously he know the future. He know that that uh, four hundred years or four thousand years will not be a different. Exactly. Now, you know, you know, uh, Sam. But but today, when when people they speak about violence in the Bible, which is happening four, uh, three, four thousand years ago. Yes. Uh, and if we compare between this violence at that time and violence today, yeah. Don't you agree today that we are more violent than the Jews at that time? Much more because we have the. The, the technology to actually wipe out everything that breathes in a nanosecond. And, and we are not doing, yeah, and we are not doing violence for the sake of uh, any righteousness. We are doing violence for oh. violence. You know, people yeah, exactly. they go for war for money. People go for war for oil. They go for war for uh, uh, for authority for power. But nobody yeah. is going for war because uh, you know because of Las Vegas. You know, <laughs> they, they are going, yeah, they are going for war. But all what they do, they justify, you know, everybody justify it the way he want. But when the war or when when a, when a violent happened, because you are going against God, this God is bad for them. But they go for war. Like, you know, uh, France, as an example, is a, is a country of democracy. 
and uh, one of the first people who have revolution in the world for democracy against uh, royal family, etc. And we know that about the revolution. But it was a very bloody revolution, extremely bloody. And uh, nobody today can condemn uh, the violence which happened in that revolution. You know, people, they were slaughtered, uh, executed, including children, including women, including even the servants of those rich ones. They did not really let anyone go. Anyone who worked in the palace, he will be executed. Anyone who was a soldier, he will be executed. Anyone who worked for the king will be executed. No mercy, no, even there is no, no court. The, the court is take five minutes and execution happen. So uh, what, what happened, you know, uh, and, and this has happened always and will repeat itself. Human being always, he tried to put down God when he want, and he always forget what kind of violence he come with and what kind of violence he live with. You know, uh, right, you know, like just a few years ago, uh, uh, you know, actually if we if we count in, in the last 100 years until now, until now, until today, how many wars the Western, they were involved in around the world? Never stop, always there is a war somewhere. But none of this war can be really justified. You know exactly. I agree. Then they're not doing it because they are holy and righteous and pure, and they hate sin. Like yeah, you said, like, they're you know, doing it out of greed, selfishness. Yeah. yeah, you know, even the war which is in Afghanistan happened, like you know, when the American they went there because of Al Qaeda. But if you think about it, you know, we are using the evil one to work for us, and we are expecting them to be good for us. So yeah. the American they use the evil one, they use Al Qaeda, they use those the, those violent people, and they thought we can make them bite the Russian. And those dogs will never bite us back. But in fact, we are the one who, you know, we are encouraging violence, and we are teaching violence, and we, and, and we, you know, we grow up in a society of violence, and then we can find a liberal who who love violence coming to give us a lecture about violence. Like you know, when when Billy Clinton he went in war, did he did he go in war because he is defending uh, the the righteousness, or because he was trying to cover his scandal in the white in the White House with Monica Lewinsky? Yeah, evil uh, to cover evil, exactly. Yeah, to keep people busy from what happened, from the scandal in the White House, he went to war and he killed tens of thousands of Christians for for a business, none, none of his business, you know? And they established an Islamic state in the heart of Europe. So the Precisely. hypocrisy of those liberals, they, they justify war when they want, and war is ugly when they want. Like, you know, when, when, uh, when all of Europe, they go in war against uh, uh, Hitler, and uh, at the end of the day, they, they decide to go and use a nuclear weapon. Now, no, I don't see any one of them complaining about using that nuke. And I don't, even, I don't see any one of those liberals saying that this is really was disgusting. Because nuke, it doesn't leave anything, even trees, even birds, even, even insects. Everything will die. Not only just women and children and, and families. You nuke a city, the whole city is dead. And those who they are a little bit far from the city, will, they will even suffer, suffer more because they will live with cancer, they will live with diseases, they, they will have a, a skin problems, and the, 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 the nuke will infect their area for, for the coming maybe 200 years. So nobody complains. They go for war, they destroy, they kill, they don't complain. But here in the issue here, our problem here is more than this. We have an idiot, this guy who claimed to be a professor, and then uh, he is saying that the, the, the Bible is more, more violent than the Quran, and the, uh, and, the, and the Quran most likely to be about defend, most or, def or defense. And yeah. this is actually what made me uh, 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 be upset. Like if he is honest, and you know, he go and see, let us see what the, what the Bible says, and let us see uh, what, what the Quran says. Uh, you know, I will say, you know what, he is at least, he is being honest. In the front of us, uh, uh, Sam, I don't know if you can read it with us, this is a hadith of, uh, for the story for Bani Quraidah. And this is a Jewish tribe. The story is very well known. Now, in here, in this story, Muhammad, he slaughtered at least 900 people, at least. But uh, what is unique about this story is there's a woman who was watching the slaughters of her family and her tribe. Uh, Aisha, she said, narrated Aisha, no woman of Bani Quraidah was killed except one. She was with me, talking and laughing on her back, which means she is really going crazy, on her, on her, uh, uh, and, and very extremely, while the Messenger of Allah 
was killing her people with the sword. Suddenly, a man called her name, where is so and so? Uh, she said, I. I asked, what is the matter with you? She said, I did a new act. She said, the man took her and he beheaded her. All right. So here we have, imagine we have a, we have a view of this. We have a movie of this. We have a woman, she is losing her mind, laughing, not because she is happy, but because she is in pain. She is badly in pain, and uh, uh, the Prophet of Islam is slaughtering the men and, and everybody one by one, and he enslaved the women and the children. This woman, because she was laughing, just because she was laughing, they beheaded her. All right? Now, this guy who did make this article or who wrote this book, when he say Islam is about defense, not about offense, I want to know where he get this from. Precisely. The, yeah. the prophet of Islam, he sent the three letters, the three kings. Did any of them, uh, 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 Sam, did any of them attack Muhammad? Like, did the Roman attack Muhammad? No, exactly not. No. Did the Persian? The Persian, is so far, the Persian is so far, far away. Like, you know, like we say, the Roman, they, they are close to, to, to the Arabian Peninsula, but the Persian is so far. And there is no way they can, you know, they have anything to do with Muhammad. Or oh, what about the Ethiopian? He sent the three letters to three kings saying, either you convert Aslim Tastam, which means convert or else, or I will kill you. But yet this guy, he makes an article saying that Islam is most likely to be about defense. Yeah, now, because he has to the Bible, that's what it is. <clears throat> They're liberals, they hate the Bible, and they will sleep with the enemy in order to destroy Christianity. So that's a given. Yeah. So, Obviously, they are full of hate, and they are not full of honesty. I wish, I am, I, am, I am not against you, by the way, to say things is true. Like, say the Bible here, look at what the Bible is saying, no problem. But to be a liar and to take a side, this is the problem. And now what about the, 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 the atheist himself? He's an atheist, isn't he? Like, how many millions the atheists they killed? How many millions, like... But that, that also shows another hypocrisy, because if you're an atheist, uh, then you don't have a standard of morality that's absolutely true. It's what we call relative, what you think is right. So, so when an atheist tells me the Bible is evil, my first question is to, to him would be, on what grounds do you know something is evil? Once you remove God, nothing is actually evil. It's something, it's true, only a preference. Something you believe, something you feel. But since you're not God, your feelings are irrelevant. See, this is hypocrisy. The only way you can tell me that what, God did here is evil is if you have a standard of right and wrong, good and bad. But if you're an atheist, where do you get the standard from? You don't have a God who can give you a standard that's absolutely true. So you're just telling me how you feel. You're giving me your personal feelings, <clears throat> what you think is right or wrong. But you're not God, so you don't determine what's right or wrong. So keep your opinions to yourself. Yeah, you know, uh, Sam, I have a question for you. It's coming from... Uh, uh, from uh, the chat. Uh, and by the way, tell them I still have a few more verses to them from the Bible. I'm not done, so don't tell them not to go. You go ahead. Ask yeah, me. Well, we have many people are listening actually. I, I just gave you the text uh, in the in the chat there. If you can see it, what is the status of the Jews uh, at the moment? Because I read the Old Testament that God removed even the Israelis from the promised land when they disobeyed, and He uh, and the Jews are not obeying God now? What do you think? Yeah, he's giving me a good question. Let me just tell you what I believe from the New Testament. I know some Christians are going to get upset. That's okay. I don't want to upset anyone, but I don't want to tickle people's ears and get Christ angry. As far as the New Testament's concerned, the revelation of Jesus Christ our Lord, the revelation he gave to the apostles, the true Israelite, the true Jew, is the one united to Christ because Jesus is the true Jew. This is not my opinion. If you read John 15, Jesus says, I am the true vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him shall bear much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. And then he says, if there's any <clears throat> branch that's not bearing fruit, that will be cut off and thrown into the fire. Why is that imagery important? If you go to John 15 verse 1 and see the true vine, Jesus is claiming to be the true Israel. Because in Isaiah 5, 1 to 7, Isaiah 5, 1 to 7, God likens Israel to a vineyard. A vineyard that doesn't produce. And because of that, he's going to destroy it. So when Jesus says, I'm the true vine, he's basically saying, I am the Israel that the nation was supposed to be, but failed. 
Therefore, if you're in Christ, the true Jew, the true Israel, you become a an Israelite spiritually in the eyes of God. That's not just John 15. I'm going to give you guys more verses. Read them. See what the apostles say. And the apostles were Jews, by the way, so you can't say, oh, they're anti-Jewish. They're Jews. What do you mean anti-Jewish? Read Romans 2, 26 to 29. Romans 2, 26 to 29. And then you can read Paul's chapters on Romans 9, 10, 11. A big discussion. A big discussion on what makes someone a true Jew in the eyes of God. Romans 2, 26 to 29. Galatians. Also, I want you to read Galatians chapter 3, the entire chapter. Paul says in Galatians 3 that it's in the seed of Abraham that all nations will be blessed. The seed. Paul says that God said seed, singular, one, not seeds, many. Then he says that seed is Christ. The true seed of Abraham that brings blessing to all the nations. He says, Paul says this, not me. He says, is Christ. And then he says that if you believe in Christ, then you become a son or daughter of Abraham. So as far as the New Testament's concerned, to be a true Israelite, to truly belong to Abraham, you have to belong to Christ. If you're an ethnic Jew and you reject Jesus, you're not of God until you accept Jesus, until you turn to Christ. So that said, does that mean that God is not going to save the Israelites? No, God is faithful. Paul says in every generation, there's a remnant of Jews, physical Jews that he saves and brings them to faith in Christ. And at the end, when Christ comes down, out of the grace of God, all those Jews who survive, every one of them, will be brought into fellowship with Christ, made one with Christ, and then they'll become true Jews. So to answer your question, until Christ comes, you're going to find Jews who do believe in Christ because of the grace of God, but that will be a remnant, not every one of them. And until Christ comes, you cannot say that the nation of Israel is pleasing to God. There is no government that's pleasing to God that rejects Jesus. If it's an Israeli government or a Saudi Arabian government or even the American government, any government, any authority, any king, any president who does not submit to Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior, who does not worship at the feet of Jesus, that government, that king is not pleasing to God because Jesus himself said, let me give you the words of Christ, John 5, 22 to 23. This is Jesus. John 5, 22, 23, he says, Furthermore, the Father judges no one, but he's given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent, who sent him. So Jesus says, you don't honor me, you don't honor God. And if you don't honor God, God will not honor you. So CP, you can answer the question for me. Yes. This modern state of Israel, Zionist government, they, in fact, most of them are not even religious, they're atheists. How can it be pleasing to God when they reject the sun and hate the sun? Not only this. Maybe. Not only this, you know, in Israel right now, they have a festival for gays and lesbians. Oh. And it is, it is, uh, you know, Israel is not is, is not a religious country. You know, it's Israel is today is Israel by name, yep. is not really a religious Israel. Yeah, exactly. You know? So not only is the Israeli government reject Jesus, so does the Saudi Arabian government. So in other words, any and all governments that do not acknowledge Jesus as Son of God as their Lord, they cannot be pleasing to God. And for those of you who want Bible verses to prove it, even in Ezekiel, the passages that Christians quote to prove. That before Christ comes, God will bring the Jews back into the land to prepare them for the coming of Christ. Go read Ezekiel 36, 20 to 23. God even says there that the reason why he brings them back, not because they're righteous. He says, on the contrary, of all the nations, you have shamed me the most. You have blasphemed my name the most. <clears throat> but because of the honor of my name, I'm going to be zealous for my name. Because again, why? It just so happens that when you think of the Jew, you think of the God of Israel, the God of Abraham. So to be Jewish associates you with the God of Abraham. That's just how it is in the world. You think Jew, oh, the God of Abraham. Even though most Jews don't believe in God. They're atheists. So you have Jews who don't believe in God, who think the Bible's fairy tale, who don't believe Abraham existed. And yet, because he's a Jew, that name Jew, people in their mind, when they think Jew, they think, oh, the God of Abraham, the descendants of Abraham. So God says it's for this for the honor of my name i'm zealous people identify you with me because they identify you with me if i let you be scattered all over the world and beaten by every nation 
they're going to think that, ah, your God failed you. So I'm going to be zealous for my name and bring you back, not because you're righteous, but because you've shamed me before the world. That's Ezekiel 36, 20 to 23. So God says it. God says, even though they come back to the land, it's not because they're righteous. It's because God is zealous for his name, and he's going to protect the honor of his name because he's zealous for his glory and praise. That's it. Biblical teaching. So if someone's angry with me, because I know a lot of people get sensitive when we talk about this issue. Notice what I did not say. I did not say that God doesn't save Jews. God saves all people from all languages, all nations, all tongues. And he's faithful to save a remnant of Jews in every generation. Proof of it, right now as we speak, there are thousands of Jews who believe in Jesus. In fact, one of the top scholars in the world, he's an outstanding scholar who debates rabbis. He debates atheists. He's even debated Bart Ehrman. And he debates the homosexual agenda. His name is Michael Brown. Michael Brown is a Jew who loves Jesus, who worships the Trinity, and he sold out for making Jesus known for, to the to the whole world, especially to the Jews. And he's wrote, wrote I'm sorry, written some outstanding books on how to prove to the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah, answering their objections. It's called Answering Jewish Objections to Jesus, Answering Jewish Objections uh, Objections to Jesus. Five volumes refuting all the major attacks against Jesus by the Jews to convince the Jews he is the Messiah, he's God in the flesh, our Lord and Savior. So yeah, every generation, there are Jews who are saved because of the grace of God. And that final generation when Christ comes down, that final remnant that is spared, that is preserved, all of them will be engrafted in to belong to Christ because of his grace, according to the Bible. So I hope that answered the question. Uh, I have actually another question. I will give it to you. Now, yes, uh, uh, this gentleman, he didn't want you to take him wrong. He is uh, trying to play, as he said, uh, devil's advocate. Okay, the that's devil, fine. right? So this is the question. I'll give it to you in the text. Sure. Uh, I'm going to play the devil, uh, uh, devils. You can read it, and you can see what, what, uh, what you said to him. Uh, well, again, he, he, he's taking the analogy and trying to press it. An analogy is that. An analogy is to help you understand the point being made without it being identical to the reality. In other words, God is not simply a landlord. He's also your life giver. Your landlord is not your life giver, so he has no right to take away your life. So instead of trying to press the analogy to make it connect in every aspect, see the analogy for what it is. Just like a landlord has the right to evict you, God has the right to evict you from the land. But how God chooses to evict you is his choice. He can evict you by wiping you out, or evict you by forcing you to leave the land. So again, don't take the analogy and run with it and assume that the analogy is identical to the reality. When I say God is like a landlord, notice, like a landlord. So that means there are going to be similarities, but there's going to be profound differences. What's the difference? He's not just the owner of your land. He's the owner of your soul, of your life. Your landlord doesn't own your soul. So obviously the analogy is going to break down. So if you're going to press the analogy, then... <clears throat> You're failing to see that an analogy is just that. It's an analogy. It's not the exact reality. So I hope that's clear. He's more than just a landlord. He's also your life giver. He yes. owns you. He owns your life. He owns your breath. He owns your spirit. So he can actually take away the breath from you, command the soul that he's given you to animate your body to return to him, and thereby you die. Because he doesn't just own your land. He owns your life. A landlord, on the other hand, only owns the land that you own. So he can expel you from the land, but in reality he has no right to take away your life because he doesn't own your life unless you've done something worthy of death. Like, for example, let's say you murdered his son. Well, in capital punishment, the law says if you've taken a life unlawfully, then your life is forfeited. So don't press the analogy too far in which you think the analogy is identical to the reality. An analogy is that. It helps to make the point that I was trying to make, that God owns the land. So he has the right to say who can live there and who, and <clears throat> who doesn't have the right to live there. But beyond that, he's more than just the owner of the land. He's the owner of your breath and your life. So God can evict you from the land either by having you leave or by causing you to die. And he can cause you to die by various means. He can cause you to die of a heart attack. He can cause you to die from cancer. He can cause you to die by flood. Or he can command an army to come and kill you. He is free to demand your life by any means he deems fit. So I hope that answered the question. So, you know, to make it simple, like when somebody thinks this way, 
that God is a landlord, you think that he owned the land only, he don't own the whole planet, including you, you know? Yeah, every this is this is the one who created you and everything is exists in this earth belong to him it doesn't belong to you yeah. uh, uh, let me can i give verses to prove that that, uh, that he owns our life because i don't want you know we're saying something but let me give some bible verses because again i don't want people to think i'm just giving opinion so real quickly let me give you some verses for all of you guys who owns our spirit who owns our breath who owns our souls let's read who has the right to give life and take it away well let's read Deuteronomy 32, 39, just to give you a biblical verse, verses to prove it. Deuteronomy 32, 39, see now that I myself am he. There is no God besides me. I put to death, because of God he has the right. I put to death and I bring to life. I have wounded and I will heal and no one can deliver out of my hand. That's Deuteronomy 32, 39. Isaiah 42, verse 5, watch this. Isaiah 42, verse 5. This is what God, Yahweh, says, the creator of the heavens, who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth with all that springs from it, who gives breath to its people, who gives breath, the breath you breathe, the life you have, he gives it to you, and life to those who walk on it, and life to those who walk on it. That was Isaiah 42, 5. Now watch this, Zechariah 12, 1. Zechariah 12, 1. A prophecy, the word of Yahweh concerning Israel. Yahweh, who stretches out the heavens, who lays the foundations of the earth, who forms the human spirit within a man, within a person, declares. So he forms your spirit. He gives you breath. He gives you life. He can take it away because he's God. And finally, one more verse for them, CP. Acts 17. I want you guys to write these down and read them on your own leisure. Acts 17, 24 to 28. Acts 17. 24 to 28. So he's more than the owner of your property. He's the owner of your life. Acts 17, 24, 28. The God who made the world and everything in it. Notice, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. Because he made everything. Everything belongs to him. He owns everything. He's sovereign over everything. This God does not live in temples built by human hands. Now watch this, verse 25. Acts 17, 24 to 28. Verse 25 specifically. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. Everything you have, your good health, your wealth, your life is from God. He owns it. It belongs to him. Your breath belongs to him. He owns your breath. He owns your soul. He owns your spirit. He owns your life. So the one who owns you has the right to take back what he's given you. So if he wants to take back your life, who's going to stop him? So let me finish the verse. From one blood, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of the lands. Here it says, he even determines when you will live, the year you'll be born, and where you will live. He marked out their appointed times. So God determined I would be born in 1972. Why? Why did he do that? Here, the answer. God did this so that you would seek him. See, he placed you exactly where you're at. And he caused you to be born in the year that you were born. For this purpose, that wherever you're at, you'll find him, know him, be saved, fall in love with him as he's in love with you, right? God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from any of us, any one of us. For in him, catch this for the questioner, it's in God we live and move and have our being. My life, my existence depends on God permitting me, causing me, to exist and sustaining my existence as some of your own poets have said we are his offspring so i hope that answered the question thank you uh actually there's somebody asked question i'm going to answer this one he's Go saying ahead. well uh do the jews right now have the right to kick the palestinian or to remove the palestinian uh first of all uh, mistakenly people they think there's palestinian in palestine the palestinian is exist there right now is the only the only one is the christians the muslims are not palestinians the Palestinians, you see, the Muslims, they came with the Amr al-Khattab, and they are themselves, they are occupation to the land. So how somebody, he is an occupier, he claimed the land for himself, all right? So mistakenly, most of people, they think, because the media keeps saying the word Palestinian, Palestinian. You see the Muslims, they occupy the land of Sam Shamoon, and now they think they call Iraq is their land. It is not. This is the land of this people, the, the Assyrian. Is that correct, Sam? Yeah. This is not yeah. their land. 
they have nothing to do with it. But now they are claiming that this land is there. And you know what? If you go there, you are occupying our land. When the American go to Iraq, the Muslim, they say, the American, they are occupying our land. The fact, this is not their land. This is the land of the Assyrian. So where is the Palestinian in the, in the territory you call it Palestine? I don't see them. There's few minority Christians and those anyway, they, they, nobody care for them. They are like, uh, uh, you know, they, they, uh, the, they don't count. They are very little minority because everybody immigrated. Everybody is running for his life. So there's no Palestinian in Palestine. The Jews, they have more right than anyone to have that the land because simply they belong to there. Like uh, if you ask, uh, 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 you know, if, if you want to be truthful, don't you agree with me that the Assyrian is the one who owned the land of Iraq? You should say that because this is the land. You know, history is saying it, facts saying it. So it is not. It's not really. Uh, my question is: was not who is the owner of the land, but the Jews could appeal to the violent verses to remove them. So uh, yeah. Sam, he's saying yeah, let me that, that the one. Jews yeah. can appeal those verses to remove the the one they call them Palestinian. No. I don't think they can because no, uh, as uh, as Sam he told you already he answered you. He said in order to appeal that. You do not need to appeal it. God himself, you will appeal it. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? Because yeah. God is the one who is going to defend you. God is going to be in your side. But if you are not in the side of God, how you can say, exactly. I'm going to use those words? You cannot. You know, like I'm a sinner. I am, I am a, a, a thief. I am an adulterer. I am a killer. And then I will say God is with me. That doesn't work. All right? Yes, yeah, okay. I so, just want to add to that, if I point that in the passages that we read, Remember, and I want the question to hear this. Remember, God warned them. He goes, I'll do to you what I'm doing to the Canaanites if you choose to walk in their wickedness. See? How can any Israelite today, any Jew in Israel, claim to be righteous and on the side of God when, as CP said, and I was told this, maybe CP, you can confirm this because I don't research into this, that actually not only does Israel have a large homosexual community, that the gay pride parade in Israel is the biggest in the world. Absolutely. Okay, so you're telling me they're on the side of God so that they can appeal to these passages? Don't yes. forget what Leviticus 18 said. Read it. I read it all the way through. He says at the end of it, he warns them. He goes, do not defy yourselves as the Canaanites did, which is the reason why I'm expelling them from the land, because I will do to you what I did to them. Basically, that's what God says. So God is quite fair. He will punish all wickedness, and punishment begins with the household of God. So if you read the Old Testament, which nation experienced God's wrath more than any other nation? Which nation was disciplined, punished, and eventually destroyed, destroyed and scattered from the land more so than any other group under the, under the sun? The Israelites, because God is a faithful God. He's impartial. He's unbiased. He's not going to overlook the sins of the Jews, but punish the sins of the Palestinians. He punishes all sins of those who refuse to fear him and repent. So no, no Jew can ap uh, appeal to these Old Testament passages because these Old, Old Testament passages, number one, they're what we call descriptive. They're describing events in the past. They're not commands for the present. This is what I wanted to finish earlier on. Unlike what you find in the Quran and Hadith, and CP is the expert on this, these commands that I gave you were for one time. It was given for a specific group at a specific place <clears throat> in a specific moment in time they're not standing commands they're not commands that we observe till this day number two all of the prophets pointed the israelites to the messiah that means for a jew to be on the side of god he has to believe in jesus so there is no jew who can appeal to the old testament passages and think god is on his side if he rejects the messiah jesus the son of god but if he accepts jesus the son of god then our lord and savior does not give us a right a right to beat people and kill kill people who refuse to accept the gospel we preach the gospel and if someone accepts it amen he say rejects it jesus says wipe the dust from your sandals because on the day of judgment god will then judge them for rejecting the gospel so if this jew ends up becoming a righteous jew pleasing to god he has no choice but to accept jesus but to accept jesus means he cannot take justice into his own hands and then kill people who refuse to accept Jesus Christ. Now, can he defend his land? That's a different story. God basically gives us all the right to defend our lands, our, our properties, and our homes. 
So that's a different context. So I hope that's clear. I'm not confusing. Yeah, you know, there's different between God being with you and you being by your own and your weapon and your army to fight for yourself. Yeah. Uh, in the front of me here, I see like they have a new festival that's coming soon. It's called Non-Stop Gay Festival to be held in Tel Aviv this winter. And supposedly, uh, the, the gay festivals in Tel, in Tel Aviv is the biggest in the world. Now, you, you don't tell me that God of Israel is there, right? So, God forbid. Yeah. Remember so what Levitic said, said CP? He said, do not let a man lie down with another man as with a woman. That's Leviticus 18. Right. Yeah. So those, those actually, uh, you know, what we see in the front of us, those are not Jews. Those have nothing to do with Jews, though, because Jews would not, would not do that. To, to be a Christian is to, to, to be a Christian, is to follow Christ. Uh, to be a Jew is to follow the, the, the law, uh, as simple as that. Obviously, those people, they have nothing to do with the law of Moses. Precisely. They, are, they are Jews by name, you know, but what is left of the Jews? Maybe they the title, but who, who is there of the Jews, you know? Uh, so we, you know, for me, I take a stand. Says Israel have the have the right to be there because this is historical land. Yeah. But I'm not taking the side of Israel because Israel is the best uh, uh, the best country in the world, and they are with God. No, you know, I'm just stating a fact. If you ask me, uh, who is really the real citizen of America? I will say the the Red Indian. Who is the real citizen of Iraq? I will say the Assyrian. Who is the real citizen of uh, of Egypt? I will say the Coptic. As simple as that. All right, so we take a stand based on an on facts, which is the truth, but not because those people are with God or not. This is what what happening. Actually, you know, uh, uh, even us the Christians, when we are not with God, God does leave, leave us alone. Look what happened to the Middle Eastern Christians. Thank you. They are scattered everywhere. Why? Because I believe strongly that they were not really too much attached to God. They became a Christian by name. So see, if you look look what's happening to the church in America because the church has become more worldly. And its approach uh, of preaching the gospel. I mean, look at it. I mean, you have Christians now who are allowing same-sex marriages, same-sex yeah. clergy, bending b uh, backwards to appease Muslims, right? Saying that no, we worship the same God. Islam is a peaceful religion. I mean, you don't even need to look to the Middle East. History is repeating itself. Look at the churches in America. Yes, and destruction will go wherever, wherever those things happen. Destruction will follow, and this is why America is coming is going down. You know, Europe. Uh, Europe before is not Europe today, and Europe tomorrow is not the same as today. And things are getting worse and worse and worse because people they are became you know uh, far away from everything right. It's not you know just if you don't want to be a believer in God. Let's say you are a person who don't want to believe in God. You know, ask yourself: Is it this is is, this, is it really normal to have such a life? Like you know, to the point that even nobody dare to say the truth. You know, they say to you. In, uh, in Europe, this is the land of democracy. In America, is, this is the land of democracy. But if you speak against gays, they, they say you are teaching hate. You see the hypocrisy? A gay, he can speak against me. A gay, he can say bad things about Christianity. An atheist, he can attack me. But if I say atheist, they will go to hell. They will say you are teaching hate. This is hypocrisy. Uh, uh, even in churches today, uh, Sam, you go to the church, you ask a priest, what do you think of gays and lesbians? What do you think of Muslims? He will start saying, um, uh, you know, God love everybody. And, uh, <laughs> you know, what uh, What do you mean God love everybody? <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah what do you, mean God? you know, God will send them to hell. What do you mean God will love everybody? God says it clearly, the one who don't follow me, he will go to hell. Stop saying and lying to people saying God love everybody. When we say God love everybody, it means he give you a chance to repent. That is the love he's given you. Amen. He has not given you an open license to be filthy and, and, and to be and to be uh, uh, doing whatever you want. This is not true. So in our churches today, we have a double standard priest. They know what the book's saying, but they will not dare to say it because simply they are doing business. Yeah, that's unfortunate. That's a situation we live in. But again. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13 8 tells us that Christ remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the same God who punished his people in the Old Testament because they became like the world. And notice how he punished them. All of you Bible students, what did God do? He would then allow the unbelieving nations, the pagans, to punish his people severely and beat them into repentance. Meaning God would give strength and power to the unbelieving nations, whether the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, even though they're steeped in paganism and morality, 
he would use them as a tool to punish Israel and then punish them for their wickedness. What's my point? <clears throat> Don't be surprised that the Muslims are at our shores for one of two reasons. Obviously, they're here so we can pray for their salvation and preach the gospel to see them get saved. But if the church keeps dropping the ball, don't be surprised that God would then use these very Muslims who are here to then punish us, bring us to our knee, knees, strike us with fear and terror because we have not learned to fear the Lord and submit to his will. Don't be surprised. Yeah, because he did the past, right? Yeah. What, what, what happened always that if, you don't, if you're not with God, God would, would take his protection from you and then you, you. you face it. You know, all the evil force in this earth will be all, all upon you. Now, uh, you know, just to make it clear, we are not against Muslims. I'm not against Muslims, by the way. I don't hate them, and I will never hate them. And we have to be truthful when we are Christians. Like, if this is the land of a Muslim, I will say, you know what? This is the land of the Muslims. If it's not, we should say it's not. As simple as that. We are not taking a side, neither in politics, neither in, in the religious, neither in... A, we always should be truthful in whatever side we take. We should we take always the side of the truth, which is the side of God. We as a Christian, we don't take a side of politics. We don't take a side of a government. We don't take a side of a president. We take a side who is truthful and who is not. So when we say Muhammad is a false prophet, we are taking the side of the truth. I'm not against Muhammad as a man. I never met him. I do not know him. Exactly. But I know for sure he's a false prophet. When I speak to a Muslim and say to him, your prophet is false, I'm not here to insult him. I'm here to show him the truth. So uh, 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 what people don't, uh, don't understand that we are not taken aside as a Christians blindly. Some some Christian, by the way, they are blind. Uh, uh, some they like you know. If you say Israel today is lost, they get upset. <laughs> you know. That's why I said it's going to cause some controversy. He yeah. Some I have to be honest to God and quote scripture. Yeah, but you know, if you may, if you may be, be truthful, you know, uh, uh, you have to be truthful. The same. How come we can say that America is is losing losing faith and losing ground with, with God? And we cannot say that to Israel. If you love the Israeli, you should tell them the truth. If you, love, if you love the Muslim, you should tell them the truth. We love everybody and we want everybody to know that you stay away from God, you are going to go to hell. It doesn't matter who you are. You are my brother, you are my sister, you are my mother, you are my father. From my family, I should say to you the truth. So what about the, the rest? I should be the same. Uh, yeah, so CP, to confirm what you said, the Bible itself says, the, the Bible that we believe in, it says that God will reward people with eternal glory or eternal punishment. And he says, the Jew first and then the Greek, the Gentile. Let me read it just so to confirm what you said. That God is fair and grants salvation to all who will accept, receive, and turn, turn to him by faith in Christ. But he's also fair in that he'll punish everyone who rejects the gospel of Jesus Christ, starting with the Jew. Let me read it for you. Romans 1.16. So the people who want biblical proof for what we're saying, Romans 1, 16, notice what Paul says. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. That's Romans 1, 16. But now notice Romans 2, 9 to 10. <clears throat> Romans 2, 9 to 10. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. So here you see how fair God is? Why the Jew first? Because they were given the promises first. The prophets came from them, something even that the Quran acknowledges. So they were given that blessing of receiving the promises. So the fulfillment of the promises is announced to them first. But because they're the first people that God set apart for himself, they will be punished first and more severely for refusing to accept the gospel. Let me give another verse just to prove that, CP. Amos 3, 1 and 2. <clears throat> Amos chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. This is Old Testament, Hebrew Bible. Amos 3, verses 1 and 2. Notice what he says about Israel, CP. Mm -hmm. Hear this word, people of Israel. The word Yahweh has spoken against you, against the whole family I brought up out of Egypt. You only have I chosen of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your sins. Can God be any more fair? Yeah, he's fair. You know, he's, he's, he, he judged the Jews. He punished the Jews the same as he punished anyone. And now here, uh, uh, Sam, the same complaint, like this guy, when he says Islam is, is a religion, uh, do not uh, go and attack. 
even even I will go back to the Jews now because now uh, brother Sam he did his, his perfect job to explain the Bible for us but isn't it the Quran too state the story that Allah which is supposedly according to the Quran he is the God of the Jews he ordered the Jews to go and attack the Palestinian and take their land yeah that's in Surah 5 when Maida 520-25 exactly yeah 20, uh, 520 uh, you, you can go and read from chapter 5 from the beginning but if we go to 521 you will see let us read together in the screen so people they can share with us uh, Allah says to, to, to Moses remember Moses said to his people all my people call the remembrance of favor of Allah up, uh, unto you when he produced etc etc and then he told his people Allah he told him O oh my people, on enter the holy land which Allah has assigned unto you. And he ordered them to go and fight. And then in verse number two, they said to him, O oh Moses, in this land there uh, are people who they are exceeding strength. Never shall we enter it until they leave, leave it. If once they leave, then we will enter it. According to the story here in the in the Quran that the Jews, they refused to go and take the land from the real owner of the land, which is supposedly the Palestinians. Yeah. So Allah, if you read the verses after, you know, in front of you on the screen, you will see Allah because they refused to kill the Palestinian. Allah caused the Jews to lose their way for 40 years. If you go to verse number 26, do you see it? Allah said, therefore the land be, uh, uh, be out of their reach for 40 years. In direction would be so he made them lose their way in the desert for 40 years for they refused to attack the Jews and take their land. But this idiot in the in the in the article he say Islam is not a religion who based on attacking to take a land, it is about defense. Yeah, but yeah. this is even not even this is about you see, he forgot the idiot here, those idiots. So sorry to use the word idiot, but I have to. They forgot that in, in, in the Quran, even the Jews are Muslims. Even the Christians, according to the Quran or the Nasara, are Muslims. Yeah. So when the Quran is stating stories about those, is stating about Allah's story. This story is not about the Jews as much as about Allah. Allah is ordering the Jews. So what Allah is ordering the Jews, He is ordering them to go and attack the Palestinian and take their land. So how come He can see that in the Bible, but He don't see that in the in the in the Quran? Because of his hate of Christ and the Bible, that's what it is. Yeah, he, he decided to be blind. He, he decided to be a, 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 not an honest person. So he said, "You know what? Look, the Bible says, go and take their land. I'm going yeah. to keep them away from their land." But it's the same story. It's in the Quran. The difference is the Quran is a plain book. There's no details. There's no details. By, how, by the way, how, you know, like now this one line, uh, Sam. When the oh, yeah. verse number twenty-six says. Allah, he made them lose their way for 40 years. Any details about the 40 years, what happened in those 40 years, we have no idea. Plain text. The Bible, yeah. There's no story. If you go in the Bible, because this is the true book about the Jews, you will see details, what happened to them, what this guy he said, what the king said, what the prophet said. There is a, there is a real life there. The Quran is just headline book. So... Go ahead, CP. I'll finish your point. I apologize. Go ahead. Yeah, he is, he's comparing between a book is full of details and book have headline and obviously he do not know even how to how to focus in the headline to see what is behind the headline. Yeah. Go ahead, Hassan. What I wanted to confirm what you said, and I wanted to to show the room, when God commanded commanded the Israelites to wipe out the Canaanites, and He did so justly, it wasn't because they refused to convert to the religion of Judaism. And that's a very important distinction. In the Quran, the commands to fight the unbelievers is a standing command. Muhammad himself in the Hadith say that there will always be a party from his ummah that will be doing jihad till the end. So he says, the command to do jihad is something that doesn't end. It's going to be a command that every Muslim who is able-bodied and God-fearing must carry out till the end of the age. And why? In order to make Allah's word triumph, so they're not attacking people because of their evil per se. They're attacking people because they don't believe like them. They're not Muslims. Now, just to show you how fair the Bible is again. Now, remember, this book was written about 1,500 years before the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm talking about the books of Moses, <clears throat> Deuteronomy, and so forth. About 1,500 years before the birth of Christ, 2,200 years before the birth of Muhammad. Just to prove to you that 
the attack on the Canaanites wasn't religiously motivated, meaning it wasn't because they refused to become quote unquote religious Jews, but because of their evil, their filth and abomination. Let me show you what God told Israel they could not do when it came to the sons of Esau and the sons of, <clears throat> of Lot. Watch this, CP. Deuteronomy 2, verses 4 and 8. And I want everyone to pay attention to see how fair God is. Deuteronomy 2, verses 4 and 8. Chapter 2, verse 4 and 8. Give the people these orders. You are about to pass through the territory, the land, of your brothers, the descendants of Esau, who live in Seir. They will be afraid of you. Notice again, CP. They will be afraid too because they see what God was doing for Israel. But be careful. Be very careful. Do not provoke them to war, for I will not give you any of their land, not even enough to put your foot on. Now here's why. I have given Esau the hill country of Seir as his own. You are to pay them in silver for the food you eat and the water you drink. Did you catch that, CP? Mm-hmm. He says, the, the Edomites, the sons of Esau, this is their land. Although they're afraid of you because they have heard of all the miracles I've done for you, do not take advantage of that fear and kill them and take their land. That land belongs to them. And if you want food, you buy it from them. Do not harm them. Right? Now watch what he says about the Ammonites and the Moabites. Deuteronomy 2, 17 to 23. Deuteronomy 2, 17 and 23. Remember, this is in 20, 20 years before Muhammad and his jihad. The Lord said to me, Deuteronomy 2, 17 and 23, Today you are to pass by the region of Moab. Moab was the son of Lot at Ar. When you come to the Ammonites, the sons of Ammon, the son of Lot, do not harass them or provoke them to war. For I will not give you possession of any land belonging to the Ammonites. I have given it as a possession to the descendants of Lot. I gave them the land like I gave you Canaan. And don't you dare try to take the land away from them. It's theirs. Don't mess with them. Now notice what else he's going to go on to say. Mm -hmm. now, this is verses 20 and 23. That too was considered the land of the Rephaites. The land that was given to the Ammonites, it was the land of the Rephaites, who used to live there. Watch this, CP. But the Ammonites called them Zemzumites. They were a people strong and numerous and as tall as the Anakites. Yahweh destroyed them from before the An Ammonites who drove them out and settled in their place. I want everyone to hear that. Here it says that Yahweh God fought for the Ammonites in destroying these giants in order to give them the land the same way he fought for Israel. But hold on. The Ammonites were idolaters, but God still fought for them. And he displaced these giants and gave the land to the Ammonites out of his love for Lot. Now let me read the rest of it. 22 to 23. Yahweh had done the same for the descendants of Esau, who lived in Seir, when he destroyed the Horites from before them. Again, God fought for the sons of Esau. The Horites were living in Seir. God gave the sons of Esau power to defeat them and throw them out of the land because he's going to give the land to the sons of Esau. So again, God fought for the sons of Esau. God fought for the sons of Lot the same way he fought for Israel. Let me finish it. They drove them out and have lived there in their place to this day. And as for the Avites who lived in villages as far as Gaza, the Kaftorites coming out of Kaftor destroyed them and settled in their place. Can God be any more fair, CP? He does for the Ammonites, the Moabites, the sons of Lot, and for the Edomites, the sons of Esau, the very thing he does for the Israelites. He fights for all of them, destroying mightier nations than them and giving them their lands. And then he tells Israel, don't you dare fight the Edomites or the Ammonites. It's their land. You have no right to it. Leave them alone. But the Edomites and the Ammonites and the Moabites were idolaters. They didn't just worship Yahweh. They worship false gods. So if this was religiously motivated, why didn't God have Israel destroy them? Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, actually, th this is remind me, uh, uh, if you remember the story, uh, I'm, I'm going to go back to the article. If you remember the story of Alexander the Great in the Quran, yeah. in, in the in the chapter of Al-Kahf, uh, Al uh, uh, Alexander the Great, uh, which is called Zul Qurnayn in the Quran, he is doing jihad. He is doing jihad. Yeah. So this one who made the article, because he is ignorant, he do not know anything about the Quran. I wish he spoke to me once so I can educate him, so I can school him. 
give him some uh, scoring in a, in a spanking way. Uh, <laughs> because uh, Zul Qurnayn, Zul Qurnayn in the Quran, Muhammad, he took every name he heard of before him, he put him in the Quran. And anyone who was victorious, he added him as a prophet of God. Zul Qurnayn, which is Alexander the Great, which is a bisexual, he is doing jihad for Allah. So he go and he attack all the earth, all the land, and he is doing jihad, and he is saying to the people, you know, like uh, in, in the meaning of, Either you, if you are a believer, I will I will reward you. If you are not a believer, I will punish you. So, as you see here with me in verse number eighty-seven, he said, "Whomever doth wrong, him shall we punish. Then shall we be shall be sent back to 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 his lord, and he will punish him and with punishment, etc." So even Alexander the Great in the Quran, he is a, a, a messenger of Allah, and he is doing jihad. In so, fact, yeah, ahead, so sorry. this is the hypocrisy of those people. That's why I'm trying to connect what uh, what uh, uh, what Sam he said. God is not taking a side uh, uh, blindly. He's yeah. not taking the side of the Jews when they are wrong. He's taking the side of anyone is right. As simple as that. Amen. When you are right, God is with you. If you are not, God is not with you. And God give you a chance, even if you are dis a disbeliever. A disbeliever. God can give you a hand even if you are a disbeliever because God he wants you to, sh to see his glory to see how good he is for you this is why the Sun will raise upon the evil and the good one correct Amen. Yeah, this is what the Bible says the Sun why the Sun raise over over the good one why the good why and the bad one why the bad one he might live in a palace right now yeah, exactly. this is not you know supposed to be God is right? See if you know, there's another thing I wish you do a video on because I don't have the technology yet. Lord willing, in time I will because I know um, people like to watch videos, not read. This has been something I wanted to write on, and I'll give the reference for everyone else in the room, and you can comment on it. Surah 27, Surah 27, 27, from verses 16 to 37. Surah 27, 16, 37. Another story that proves your point. Solomon hears about Sheba being ruled by a queen. They worship the sun. Now, the Queen of Sheba and her people know nothing about Solomon. They haven't heard about Solomon. They haven't attacked Solomon. They haven't hurt Solomon. So Solomon sends them a threatening letter saying they better submit to Allah or he's going to come with his hordes and punish them. Notice here what Muhammad did to Solomon. He made Solomon resemble him. He has Solomon threatening to attack a people who hadn't harmed Solomon. And Solomon threatens to attack them and subjugate them and humiliate them because they worship the sun and not Allah. And then it says something beautiful in 37, because this ties in with chapter 9, verse 29. In 37, notice what it says, that Solomon says. Return unto them, we verily shall come unto them with hosts that they cannot resist, and we shall drive them out from thence with shame, and they will be abased. That word abased is sahirun. That's the very word in Surah 929 about the jizya, is it not? Yes. So isn't this true that Muhammad made Solomon resemble Muhammad in that he's putting into the life of Solomon Solomon's desire to attack unbeliever for their unbelief and then humiliate them because Muhammad was going to use that as an example saying see I'm like Solomon he attacked unbelievers who didn't attack him because they didn't believe the right way and humiliated them so I'm a prophet like Solomon isn't this an example of Muhammad making Solomon into a jihadi like him all, all the names all, actually if you study all the names like you know good you mentioned this one uh, for those who want to see the reference, you can go to chapter 27, verse number uh, uh, 37. Uh, 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 this is where it says Sagirun. Uh, all the all the names is in the Quran. Solomon, David, all of them. Uh, everybody there is about is, is doing jihad. It's a duty for a Muslim. Islam is based on jihad. Actually, even Jesus, according to the Quran, when he come back, he would do jihad. <laughs> you know, when Jesus come back, what his duty is? Is a duty like you know for us his duty is different from their duty but for the muslim they understand it as jihad jesus when he came back he will come as a as a war a warlord who is going to fight the infidels and then he will make everybody believe in him all right so no non-believer will exist everybody will become a muslim who believe in jesus and uh, uh, this is his duty and then he, he even when he meet the shaitan uh, he will conquer the shaitan he will kill the pig and he will destroy the cross. That is the jihad of Jesus, according to Islam. So, everybody in, in Islam is about jihad. 
And everybody in Islam is about offense, not defense. But yet those liberals, they come to you and say that Islam is a religion of defense, not offense. When it is totally the opposite. You know, I think, I think what happened to, uh, uh, to this guy, uh, you know, he, uh, he read verses like it says, the, it says uh, you know, fight those who fight to fight you. You know what I mean? And yeah. then he said, you know what? Uh, it says clearly, like in chapter 2, verse number 190, it says, uh, uh, fight for the sake of Allah, those who fight you. But he do not know that Muslims consider anyone who don't accept Islam is in a fight with them. You got it. Yeah. You know, in oh. Islam, you know, the, uh, the Quran says clearly, fight those who don't believe in Allah, not those who fight you. So who is the one who fight you is the one who refuses Islam. Muslims, they will send you a letter like Muhammad saying, either you convert, or you pay the jizya if you are a Christian. That is an option only for the Christian and the Jews, by the way. If you are an atheist, you will be killed. Or you convert. Not, no, no for the choice. The choice of jizya only for the people of the book. So, uh, uh, being not accepting Islam make you guilty. Like there's a video of a guy, his name, uh, actually you debated him, Shawadri, right? You've been yeah, with him in the debate yeah. before. They asked him in the BBC uh, channel, they asked him about... Uh, uh, do you condemn the killing of innocent people in the train attack in, in London? He said, uh, when you talk about innocent, we have to give a definition. In the eyes of Allah, they are not innocent. The gentleman, he said, why they are they not innocent? Are you kidding me? He said, yes, because when you don't accept Islam, you are guilty. Yeah. So, so Muslims will say to you, Islam says that if you kill one innocent man, as if you killed all mankind, but they will not tell you that the innocent man in Islam is a Muslim. Exactly. You know? I mean, yeah. I mean. So the fool, when he make a study, because he is short in, in, in knowledge, and he think he is a professor, like James White, you know, sometimes he defend Islam, sadly. Uh, he is a professor, but he is a professor in the Bible, maybe, but he have no idea what he's talking about in the, in the, when it's come to, 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 to Islam. So they mention things, it's not true, far away from the truth, and that will be embarrassing for even the Christians. So we have to be careful we are listening to who. Who is the one who is teaching us and how much he know, you know? And then we can really can take him as legitimate, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a person to, to listen to. You know, uh, when, when, when someone like James White, he keep talking about, about Islam and uh, be, suddenly became, he became a scholar in Islam. How? I have no idea. And then he says, ISIS is not Islam. How? I have no idea. And then he says that uh, Aisha, the age of Aisha was coming at that time. How? I have no idea. So we have to be careful. Not everyone make an article. It's mean we listen to him, and not everyone say something. It's mean he is he, he's, he's a person who is giving you the answer. There is people like you see. For me, I prefer to have a brother uh, Sam with me when we talk about the Bible because I have to admit, I have to say that brother Sam, he is a lot more strong than me when it's come to the Bible. I have, I you know, I I say it in front of him, and I have no problem to say that this is the truth. Uh, so we need to ask. Let us say. Give your dish to the cook, the right cook, the one who his specialty, this kind of food, he will give you the good cooking. You don't give your cooking for someone who do not know what Islam, and you ask him to answer you. You will give a stupid answer, full of mistakes. So try always to get the right one to answer your question. By the grace of God, everything good from the Lord Jesus, he gets all the glory and praise, so we thank him. Uh, do we have any more questions, guys? Yeah, I have about nine minutes because at seven I have to be yeah, ready. Almost we are done. If there is anyone have a last question before before brother uh, Sam he leave, you can give us the the question. I think we have one already. Okay, by the way, see, before the yes question, yes. was the presentation from the Old Testament clear for them? They understand that it's nothing I like the Quran. I don't see any question about that. I see a question here from uh, from a brother. Brother, his name is Najib. Uh, he's, uh, he's saying, waging war in Surah 5, uh, verse number 33, means disbelieve, according to Ibn Kathir. Yeah, exactly. yeah. what, what, he think, what do you think about that? He's asking oh, that's 100% right. Now, you know that. You're the, you're the scholar of Islam. So Look, The question is for you. <laughs> if you're the scholar, I'll let you answer. But I've already written an article showing that from Ibn Kathir himself, yeah. mischief, according to Ibn Kathir, is to teach something contrary to what Muhammad taught, to question right. Muhammad. So that's mischief, spreading mischief in the land, yeah. to go against Muhammad's teaching. You do that, that's it. 
that means they can crucify you or cut off your hands and feet of opposite sides or exile you. If you go around saying, no, Jesus is the Son of God and the Bible is not changed and Muhammad was mistaken here, that's it. You're spreading mischief. They're going to kill you. Cool. Yeah, he's right. And you know that more than me. You know the Arabic, so you can comment on that. Uh, mischief in Islam is not about committing, because, you know, we need to understand what is a crime in Islam. Crime in yep. Islam is to reject any of the teaching of the Prophet. And this is actually a very high crime, which is can cause you losing your life. So if you reject, actually, according to Muhammad, if you drink four times beer, four times, three times, is enough to kill you because first time they will whip you, second time they will whip you, third time they will whip you, and that will be your last time for for, for you to live. So Islam, it, even <laughs> drinking beer can be mischief, man, to the point you leave your, your you know you lose your life because if you exceed, if you go against the law of Muhammad, you are doing mischief, man. Anything. So if you say Jesus is God, this is mischief, man. If you say the Bible is true, this is mischief, man. If you say uh, 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 you know. Uh, 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 the Bible is not corrupt. This is mischief. And if you say Muhammad is a false prophet, this is a big mischief. Man. So mischief in, in, the, in the Quran is not about you being a thief. It can be. It can be about being a thief. It can be about you know being an, uh, 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 you know uh, doing something bad. But generally sp speaking, anything you do against the teaching of Muhammad is mischief. Man. All right. This is why Abu Bakr he went in a war to. Uh, it's called the war of apostate. Why? Because this is mischief meant. So he have to punish them. So what is their crime? They did not rape anyone. They did not kill anyone. They did not, you know, Muhammad, he died. They don't want to be Muslim no more. So Abu Bakr, he launched a war. It's called the, the, the war of Abu State. So mischief in Islam have nothing to do with you being, uh, being doing something bad. Bad in the eyes of Islam can be good in my eye. As an example, attacking Christians like now the Mujahideen in Syria and in Iraq, they attack the, the Yazidi, and this is not mischief for any Muslim, because the Yazidi are kuffar. Yeah. None of the Muslims will be upset from that. This is not a mischief. The one who is doing mischief is the Yazidi, because they are not worshipping the God of Islam. So yeah. the Yazidi are the, the, the criminals here. So in the eyes of Islam, the victim is the criminal, and the criminal is the victim. I hope we, we answer him. Anyway, uh, I, I know I know your time is up. Uh, yeah, I have to go, CB. But Lord of God, call me anytime when you want to do more shows because it will be my pleasure to be the Bible answer man to your Quran answer man. You're sure, the Quran we can answer man. I'll be the Bible answer man by the grace and power of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, I, I'm sure people, they would like to have you more and more here. And uh, it's my pleasure to always to have you. And actually, we, we always together in the chat room. But uh, maybe in here it's better because... Uh, uh, it's live on air and people and next time i will be sure the chat will be uh, will be on i yeah. will see why it's not working so people they can ask questions directly and they can uh, interact with us so thank you uh, uh, brother uh, uh, Simon. thank you, you brother. Brother. Yeah. and uh, we pray to the lord uh, that we we give you the, the the right answers and may the lord forgive us if we made any mistake or we forgot Amen. something Amen. to say all right Amen. Uh, god bless you guys and lord jesus watch over you cp and protect you and protect all our listening like I, I come in agreement with CP, if I made any mistakes, God forgive me, protect you from those errors. But if we said things that were true, may you confirm in your hearts and give us the power to live those truths and to love Jesus <clears throat> to the point of dying for him because he's worthy. Amen. Come Lord Jesus. God bless you, CP. I mean, God bless. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye.